Hello everybody, happy 2023. It feels good to be back. And over the past couple weeks, I've had the opportunity to do some really interesting things, both with Unity's data-oriented technology stack and just in the tech industry in general. So in today's video, I wanna talk a little bit about those things as I kind of ease back into making videos because I got some really awesome things planned for 2023. Okay, so let's just get right into it. So about a month ago, I worked with this company called Dimension X to co-host a hackathon where we tasked the participants to create something using Unity's data-oriented technology stack. Now, this first event was a little bit of a test event, so don't worry if you missed this one because we are going to be doing more ones like this in the future. I definitely will keep you posted on that. But anyways, almost immediately after that hackathon was over, this company company actually had some work to be completed using Unity's data-oriented technology stack um, that they were completing for another company and kind of needed some of my assistance on it. So they brought me on board and I was able to help them with this project that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. But the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because they were going to be showcasing this project at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, this year in Las Vegas. And so because of my involvement with this project, they graciously invited me to CES to help showcase their project at their booth. Now, if you're not familiar with CES, it's pretty much the big consumer electronics show that happens every January where all the major electronics manufacturers, you know, we're talking about everything from phones and TVs to VR headsets and new automotive vehicles. They all showcase their new tech at this big event every single year. Now, I've never actually been to this event, so it was kind of like a win-win situation. I was able to go um, help with their booth and kind of showcase some cool dots things that we were working on, as well as just go and see CES for the first time. Now, during the show, we were showcasing two different platforms. The first one is one that Dimension X has been developing out since its inception, which they call Bonfire. Basically, the whole idea behind Bonfire is it's an easy to use drag and drop solution to allow people to create their own immersive connected experiences. And so really the main driving force behind it is to empower storytellers and creators to create their own immersive experiences nice and easily. So it's just an easy to use drag and drop interface. You can drop things into the scene, add different behaviors to them. Then you can easily share these experiences out with your friends who can join in from any device, whether that be a mobile phone, tablet, computer, VR headset, anything. And one of the really cool features of Bonfire is that it allows for live real-time editing of these experiences. So maybe as your friends are going along through a quest that you've designed, if they're just doing super well in the quest, if you want, you can just say, throw a giant dragon into the world and then have them deal with that. So Dimension X is targeting their initial release of this platform for GDC of this year, which is going to be in March. And then at that time, they plan to open out the initial version of this tool set to the public at which time you'll be able to create your own immersive experiences. So I'm sure I'll be talking a lot more about that one as we get closer to the release of that. Now, the other platform that we're showcasing is the one that they brought me on to help develop, which is what they call Polyhesion. Now, Polyhesion is basically a way that you can test scale to a large number of dynamic entities or users in a particular simulation or world. So in the particular demo that we're showcasing with Polyhesion is we're showing how we could scale to a large number of VR connected users. Now, of course, many VR experiences, they're gonna be capped out at probably like 40 to 80 VR users at the maximum in one particular world. Now, what we're showcasing with Polyhesion is how we could scale up to 1,000 VR network connected users all in one world. So of course, on the server side, this uses Unity Dots for all the very fast and efficient processing and actually sends that over a network to the front end client. Now the front end client can pretty much be anything. Like as I was developing it along because I was doing all the Unity stuff, I actually developed a little Unity test client to just make sure I'm you know, receiving all the correct data that I am. But for the actual demo showcase, we used an Unreal client on the front end. So we actually used Unreal's entity mass system to create this little simulation. And because we're using Unreal 5.1, we can use Nanite and Lumen and all, all that fun stuff. So again, we're using Unity dots on the server side and sending that over the network to an Unreal client on the front end. So it was a pretty cool setup. So those are basically the platforms that we're showcasing, but you know, really the best part about working the booth is just being able to meet so many awesome people. I mean, we met with all kinds of people from students all the way up to VPs and CSOs suite executives of major companies. We had all kinds of people come by the booth and get just a ton of feedback on some of the things that we we're showcasing and what some of the use cases they might have for it. And I think we got a lot of really positive interest over the course of the weekend. So that was just, you know, really reassuring for, you know, everyone who's been working on these projects. So anyways, that's most of the kind of game dev related stuff that I have for today's video, but I still do want to talk a lot about the cool tech that I saw at CES because there was a ton of that. So again, CES isn't really a game dev show. It's more of just a general tech industry show. So our booth was kind of inside the metaverse VR and gaming type uh, section that they had blocked off. 
And as I was walking around, that was honestly probably the most packed section out of like all the different sections that I toured. You know, maybe it was just kind of the timing of things, but I feel like that was where like the most interest in the show was, you know, and most of the people were there to see those types of things. So let's start by talking a little bit about augmented reality because there's a lot of really cool augmented reality stuff being shown off. So really the big one that was being showcased at CES was Magic Leap, their Magic Leap 2 headset, which is basically just some AR glasses and there's kind of a little like circular, you know, processing unit or whatever um, that you can kind of hold or strap over your shoulder as you're using it. I did get a chance to try out the demo. So when you went to get a demo, you were assigned to one of six different demos. And the one that I got was basically showcasing the local dimming feature, which is a really interesting feature of these headsets. So basically, you know, the whole idea is if you have some AR glasses and they kind of have like maybe an image of something kind of sitting on the table, you know, you're still going to be able to kind of see through that image and see sort of see the things behind it. Well, with the local dimming, it can actually basically black out that region where there's an object and then so you can't actually see behind it. So it kind of sticks out more prominently in front of, you know, whatever is actually in the world. So they kind of had like this little table set up with some kind of like boxes on it. And then basically what would happen is they would like overlay a image of a building and they would kind of block out some of those boxes on the table. So you could, you know, really visualize what this image looks like if those boxes weren't there kind of thing. And also there was a global dimming feature where if you hit that, then it basically just blocks out the screen and then you're basically just seeing the AR images but you're not seeing anything in the real world. I mean if you look closely you can kind of see through it a little bit but overall it basically blacks out the screen and it's similar to being in a VR headset, but it's not quite that like same immersion because again, they're just kind of some glasses on your face. Now, I know a lot of people like to talk about the FOV, the field of view when you're wearing these AR headsets and the Magic Leap, it's definitely not your whole field of vision, but it's really just kind of the main part of your, your field of vision right there. You know, the image kind of gets cut off a little bit, especially if it's again, something like a tall building, but really it's to the point where I don't think you necessarily need that much more than it for most of the use cases cases that they're using it for, um, for like, you know, business applications and those types of things. But it is just kind of cooler to get a wider field of view and immersion. And so speaking of a wider field of view, there was another company called Ant Reality who were showing off some of their AR optics. And they were showcasing some lenses with a really high field of view. Now, basically this company, they just kind of create the lenses. So they don't really create the glasses and some of the software around it. So like some of the glasses that they were showcasing them in, they don't have like any type of tracking. So if you kind of like move your head around, it's just going to be that same kind of image in front of you. And again, there's kind of still some trade-offs on some things. So even though the field of view is really good, you know, the resolution wasn't like really amazing. It, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't like really amazing. And they also had one with kind of a global dimming type feature where the demo that they had showcased, you could basically just push these two buttons for AR and VR. And then so with AR, it basically just kind of, you know, shows the image in kind of a standard AR. And then you hit VR and then again, it blanks out to the screen kind of similar to the Magic Leap, so then you can basically be in a more immersed experience. And while we're on the topics of AR and VR, go ahead and take a look at this crazy dystopian video that I took of all these people plugged into the metaverse. As I walked by this booth, I just thought that was hilarious with all these people just like jacked into the metaverse. So moving over to displays, of course, you know, CES, they're always going to be showcasing their, you know, cool TVs and displays. Um, you know, one of the interesting themes going on this year was wireless displays. So that's like, you know, completely wire-free displays. Um, I think they use like hot swappable batteries to basically keep them active. So you don't even need a power cord for these. I mean, I personally don't want to be putting batteries in my TV every so often. Then, but um, you know, I'm sure there are some people who just kind of like the you know completely clean and no cables look. Also, 3D displays are kind of always going to be showcased at something like CES. Uh, so Sony was showing, showing actually quite an interesting one where they basically had a 3D display that was sitting at kind of like a 45 degree angle, and it had like a little webcam on the top of it. The whole idea is that it basically tracks your head and eye movement. So no matter you know what angle you're looking at it, you always get a 3D image. Now it was really cool because you kind of look down and then you sort of like can look down into the image. So one of the videos that they were playing was basically like a soccer field. And so as you were standing up and looking down, you're kind of like looking down on the soccer game. But then if you kind of lean down like this, you could actually look out into the crowd. So it was kind of a cool effect. Also at the Microsoft booth, they were showcasing a curved display that you could actually switch between it being a flat display and a curved display. 
So it actually handles on both ends of the display, and then you can bring it in and curve it, and then it can be a curved monitor, and then you can push it back and it can be a flat monitor. But let me show you a video of the guy demonstrating this, showing this joke that he probably told 100,000 times over the course of CES. You can also fold it all the way in half if you want, but you can only do that one time. Yeah, okay. And then you're throwing it away. Fair. Also, I do want to shout out this kind of large holographic display that they had showcasing, um, just because it was just like bumping this loud music the entire showcase. You know, no matter where you went in the whole like gaming metaverse section, you heard this song just bumping the entire time. But anyways, it kind of uses these like fan blades with LEDs on them, um, and they kind of spin around, and then they make these like massive holographic displays. So they were kind of showcasing this, you know, AI type person doing a little song and dance kind of thing. And then for some reason, Mark Cuban was also on that, you know, <laughs> talking about being in the metaverse or something. So just to talk about some miscellaneous things before we get into some of the vehicle tech, because there's a lot of really cool vehicle tech showcased there. Um, there are a lot of keyboards being showcased, you know, mechanical keyboards. One interesting one is they had a completely waterproof one. They actually had it inside of a fish tank and you could kind of like, you know, put your hand in there and tap on the keys. Um, you know, completely waterproof and all that. Also, one booth was showcasing a digital Rubik's Cube that you could sync up with an application. And then, so here's a little video of me solving the, the digital cube here. Um, it was a little bit weird. The corners were a little bit rounded, so it kind of threw me off because it's a little bit different than just like a regular Rubik's Cube. But you can basically synchronize it with this app that times you on how quickly you can solve the cube. And also gives you a little bit of stats about, you know, where you might have messed up and how you can kind of improve your time. As I was going along, I definitely messed up at one place, so I didn't get as fast of a time as I could have. But it was still kind of cool because when you finish solving it, it kind of like lights up and gives you this little like cheer at the end. Now, one super nerdy and random thing that I came across was was this nano wave mesh technology that can basically be used to direct light or other you know electromagnetic waves so basically it's this mesh that they create through a lithographic process similar to like creating a CPU or something like that and they can basically lay this mesh onto a piece of glass and then depending on how that mesh was created you know they can now use that to essentially you know perfectly mirror you know bounce off the different uh, light or radio waves or they can kind of direct them so if it's coming in at an angle they can direct it to go straight forward or have it kind of like you know disperse out they can do a lot of kind of interesting things with that one of the use cases they say is they can kind of like direct 5g through buildings in a certain pattern so there's kind of you know adequate coverage inside or there's also some three-letter agencies who've reached out to them to basically block all of you know incoming radio waves and one other use for it they were demonstrating is having a perfectly clear microwave screen so basically the you know window into your microwave you know using that technology they can have a perfectly clear screen so you can see you know exactly how much your food is cooking so it was just one of those you know surprisingly interesting booths that i came across as i was going about um, so going into some of the cool vehicle tech so of course they had drones lots of drones not just regular old drones but really big drones with you know these giant camera gimbals that were mounted on them they even had a actual person drone with a seat in it that you could sit in and fly around. Unfortunately, they didn't have a live demo of it. It was just kind of the unit sitting in the middle of the show floor, but it was cool enough to see nonetheless. Also, the mail was there for some reason. It was super random to see the United States Postal Service showcasing their really, really lame looking new mail carrier. Um, it is still a gas powered mail carrier, but apparently it's easy they designed it to be easily converted to electric power. But um, yeah, the design eh, leaves a lot to be desired. But speaking of electric vehicles, there were way too many electric vehicles to count. And I didn't even take pictures of most of them because most of them were honestly just quite boring, just you know, like regular cars or like buses or delivery vehicles or something like that. But it was really weird to see, you know, how many electric car companies were there. I don't know if you know, all these companies are manufacturing their own, or if it's just, you know, like two companies out there making all these cars and they're all just kind of branding them differently. But there were so many electric car companies and I don't know if the electric car market is big enough right now to sustain all of these big electric car companies, but time will tell. Also, there were some, you know, traditional car companies showcasing their new electric vehicles. So Dodge was there, they had an electric Ram pickup truck. Also this like electric Challenger looking thing, which was kind of cool. And they're also showcasing some things in their existing 4xe, which is a plug-in hybrid lineup. Also, 
Caterpillar was there, like the construction company Cat, were showcasing some actually really interesting things. One thing they were showcasing was basically a remote excavator. So they had two remote excavators, like one in Arizona and one in Illinois, that you could actually sit down and control. The line firm was kind of long, so I didn't get to try it out to see, you know, how the latency is, but it seemed to be working pretty well. I think it was just super cool that they had these actual real live excavators you know, sitting out in the middle of a field and then people could basically just dig them up with the controls there. They also had this massive fully autonomous dump truck. Here's a picture of me standing next to the wheel of this beast. I mean, I'm six foot four and I look like a freaking little ant next to this thing. Oh, also they said that this was the smallest dump truck that they had. And there's also a staircase that allows you to go up on top and you can be basically in the bed of the dump truck and see kind of the, get an overview of the show floor and take a look at how small that Hummer EV looks like from the top of this dump truck. Although I did get to check out the Hummer EV, that was super cool. And actually, if I was in the market for an electric truck, which I'm not, the Hummer EV would probably be my choice. I think that one looks so cool. I know it has a lot of really cool features. Um, that would probably be the one that I go for. Actually, on second thought, it would probably be this mini electric utility vehicle. This thing is actually awesome. I could just imagine, you know, ripping up and down trails in this thing, you know, fully electric. That looks like a ton of fun. I'm gonna go get one of those right now. But seriously, I had an absolute blast at CES. Once again, thank you so much to Dimension X for inviting me out there. Um, had a, a fantastic time. Uh, definitely looking forward to your launch of Bonfire at GDC coming up later this year. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today's video. Subscribe for video game development content. I'll see you in the next one.